Okay, it is the top of the hour, so let's get started. Welcome uh, to the Radical Health Summer Lecture Series. My name is Timothy Byers. I'm the president of Radical Health and the director of cannabis programs at Pacific College of Health and Science. And I'm also joined by Radical Health CEO and palliative care nurse practitioner at Stanford Healthcare, Eloise Thiessen. Uh, the summer lecture series is comprised of eight 20 minute lectures that cover a range of cannabis healthcare and industry topics. Uh, Eloise and I will be providing these lectures most Thursdays during June and July. We have one in early August as well. There are a couple of weeks uh, during that time where there is no lecture scheduled, so just be sure to review the calendar. Uh, and of course, we'll send out weekly reminders. So if you are not part of the radical community, or on our email list, please be sure uh, that you join. Uh, the Radical community is comprised of advocates and educators and healthcare professionals, cannabis stakeholders, uh, and we intend to provide support and information and resources to our members. So for information about how to join, you can go to our website, radicalhealthcare.com, click the community link, it's free to sign up, just really just add you to our email list so that you can stay informed about any of our future events. Uh, also, I want to remind everyone that we have an array of curriculum options at a range of price points for both students and working professionals. So whether you're helping customers make good product choices or maybe you're treating patients, uh, advocating for social change, maybe you're just simply using cannabis yourself, you need evidence-based factual information about cannabis. Radical Health Curricula is up to date, it's comprehensive, and it's informed by clinical expertise and experience and instructional design expertise and experience. So uh, please reach out to us for information or click the education link on our website. Uh, the presentation today is for educational purposes only and the information presented today is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. Uh, this information is not meant to help in the diagnosis, prognosis or treatment of any virus, disease, illness or condition. If you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat or hold them until the end. We will have some time uh, at the end of the lecture today uh, for Q&A. So tonight we're talking about CB1 antagonists. What are they and why do we care? Um, for the sake of time, uh, because these lectures are only uh, really about 20 minutes long, I'm not able to cover tonight the six types of ligands that can bind to a cannabinoid receptor. So if you need a review of ligand binding types at CB1, uh, you can watch a free video on our Radical Health YouTube channel. It's called Introduction to the ECS, a comprehensive review. Uh, just go to YouTube, type in Radical Health, and you will find it at our, um, at our YouTube channel. Uh, for this talk tonight, you should simply know that CB1 antagonists inhibit the signaling of the CB1 receptor. So, it... all right. Let's start with why we should care. So why are CB1 antagonists important to research and develop? Um, initially, these antagonists were developed to uh, combat uh, and profit from uh, an obesity epidemic. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, the issue of obesity has grown to epidemic proportions, with over 4 million people dying each year as a result of being overweight or obese. The CDC estimated in 2020 that nearly 42% of Americans are obese. So obesity-related conditions include things like heart disease and stroke and type 2 diabetes and also some cancers. And these conditions are among the leading causes of preventable and premature death. There does exist a rapidly growing understanding about how the endocannabinoid system uh, affects body weight control. So current data suggests that modulation of the ECS can have uh, significant imp uh, implications for things like taste sensations, food seeking motivations, feelings of satiety, uh, managing metabolic imbalances or abnormalities, insulin resistance, ghrelin production, weight control, body mass index, fasting glucose and lipids, gut microbes, which also can influence mood, and weight gain associated with increases in pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, furthermore, it's well established that THC, or, or rather the activation of CB1 receptors, stimulates appetite. 
So consequently, suppressing activation of CB1 should reduce appetite. So a lot of CB1 research has been focused on decreased consumption and satiety. Uh, a study in uh, CB1 knockout mice suggested that these mice with inactivated CB1 receptors uh, were resistant to obesity and had improved energy metabolism. So there's actually a fairly large body of research in animals and humans uh, to support CB1 suppression and weight loss. And we're gonna discuss uh, some of that research just a bit later. Uh, so that's one reason why we should care about CB1 antagonists as a novel therapeutic for the treatment of metabolic disorders and specifically obesity. Uh, there is a second reason as well, and that's for the treatment of acute toxicity and overconsumption of THC. So we've probably all known someone or have ourselves experienced an episode of THC overconsumption. And while these episodes are usually manageable without clinical intervention, the symptoms of severe THC overconsumption can sometimes lead a consumer to believe that uh, a visit to the ER is necessary. Uh, and unfortunately, there's not a lot that clinicians can do in the ER outside of hydrating a patient, uh, an adult patient, and uh, perhaps giving them something like an angiolytic or a sedative. But what if there was a THC antidote that's similar to the use of uh, Narcan for an opioid uh, overdose? So our clinicians on the call will all know that Narcan is a brand of generic opioid called uh, naloxone. Uh, the drug is an opioid receptor antagonist. It binds to the mu opioid receptor so that when people OD on an opioid, they have a very high concentration of opioid agonists that are bound to these receptors. And when naloxone is injected or, or sprayed into the nose, uh, the concentration is enough to nearly displace the existing opioids from the receptors. And it can almost immediately reverse an, an overdose. It usually takes somewhere in the two to eight minute range. So naloxone is an opioid receptor neutral antagonist. And it was designed to have a much higher affinity than other opioid drugs at opioid receptors. So naloxone can displace the opioids at receptors and immediately reverse the harmful effects. So a CB1 neutral antagonist with high receptor affinity might produce the same effects for a THC overdose. And with increasing uh, cannabis legalization, there is a growing need for an effective THC antidote especially in hospital settings, and especially for pediatric exposure to THC acute toxicity. So after THC exposure, children can present with symptoms that are very different than those observed in adults. So for example, adults will often present with CNS excitation, right? They, we get anxiety, we get paranoid, we, get, we have tachycardia. Children, however, can present with central nervous system depression. Uh, including drowsiness and lethargy and ataxia, uh, and in a few rare cases, even coma. And given the smaller weight of pediatric patients, especially the really little ones, uh, even doses that are somewhat normal uh, or even low for an adult can put children at risk for increased toxicity. So this is a study that looked at exposures in children younger than six years of age uh, between 2017 and 2021. There were 7,043 exposures reported during this uh, period. 23% of those patients were admitted uh, to the hospital. Uh, in 70% of these cases, the child had central nervous system depression. Uh, in 20, uh, 2017, there were 207 reported cases. And in 2021, there were 3,054 cases. So that's an increase of about 13,075%. Uh, in 2% of these cases, so about 90 of the cases, uh, the child uh, developed major CNS depression or coma. And furthermore, there were 79 cases where the child was seizing. So that's why we should care about CB1 antagonists. Um, so, you know, the first thing that we want to ask is, well, are there any that we can use right now? And, 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 and first of all, we should ask, are there any naturally occurring cannabinoids that are CB1 antagonists? You know, we have more than 120 phytocannabinoids that have been identified in cannabis. And there are some uh, cannabinoids that are uh, neutral antagonists or negative allosteric modulators at CB1. So for example, THCV and CBD respectively. Uh, 
CBD uh, is a negative allosteric modulator at CB1 in larger doses. It might have an ability to suppress appetite, um, but allosteric modulation is, is quite subtle. And what we're really looking for is a compound to compete at the orthosteric site, at the main binding site at CB1. So we also mentioned THCV uh, in popular media. Uh, cannabis chemovars with high levels of THCV are sometimes referred to as diet weed. Uh, and some studies suggest that this cannabinoid can suppress appetite. So in fact, a small uh, double-blind study suggested that THCV might be used as an appetite suppressant and as a novel therapeutic to help treat obesity. Um, so it is possible that THCV can suppress CB1 activation. There's, there's some research to, su to support this. Um, CB1 suppression via THCV uh, it produces hypophagic effects in both fasted and non-fasted mice. Hypophagia is the suppression of caloric intake, and that usually results from a reduction in, in the feeding behavior. Um, there, the existing research also suggests that CB1 suppression, and again, specifically through uh, Delta 9 THCV, uh, produces anti-obesity effects by increasing energy expenditure as well, more so than uh, by reducing food intake. And finally, CB1 suppression um, via THCV seems to reduce the amount of time that normal weighted mice spend close to a food hopper. So it's both suppressing appetite and it's increasing energy, uh, energy metabolism. Um, that said, uh, THCV's pharmacodynamic activity is pretty complicated. Um, you know, back in the 70s, some researchers thought that THCV was responsible for about a quarter of the psychoactivity of THC. More recent research suggests that THCV might not produce any psychoactivity on its own at all. Uh, the differences between these findings might be accounted for by differences in the study methodologies. So, for example, some of the studies might have been uh, they might have been using very low doses of THCV. Others might have been using very high doses of THCV. Currently, the research suggests that THCV might be both an agonist and a neutral antagonist at CB1 receptors, it, and, and that, that would depend on the concentration. So at, at low concentrations, so um, I think the studies were at three milligrams per kilogram uh, or less, and this was administered via uh, IV. Uh, THCV seems to act like an antagonist at CB1, whereas at high concentrations, this was 10 milligrams uh, of THCV per kilogram uh, of body weight administered via IV, uh, THCV seems to act like an agonist at CB1 and, and produce mild psychoactivity. Now, all of this remains somewhat speculative. Um, to further muddy the water, some additional evidence supports the idea that THCV might also be an indirect agonist. So for example, in one study, uh, when it was administered in high doses, THCV seemed to potentiate the anti-nociceptive effects of THC, right? So we get these, um, th these effects where it can help pain when you activate CB1. Well, you know, is THCV activating CB1? Is that, is that how it's potentiating THC? There's also some speculation that THCV might be able to inhibit the uptake of both anandamide and 2-AG. So that means that those uh, endocannabinoids can stay in the system longer and continue to do their work and produce uh, the, those positive benefits. There's also some unsighted internet speculation that perhaps THCV can inhibit the enzyme FA, um, but I haven't really seen any, any good evidence in the medical literature to support that. Um, and also we've, we've seen um, examples of uh, rat FA in, inhibitors fail to have similar effects in humans and CPD is one of those. So there is some possibility here, uh, in, especially in the treatment of metabolic disorders via suppression of appetite. Uh, however, uh, regardless of how THCV binds at CB1, uh, it simply lacks the affinity uh, to displace delta-9 THC from CB1 receptor sites in a manner that's required for a THC antidote. So recall that delta-9 THC has a five carbon side chain. You can see that in the slide here. And THCV has a shorter side chain. It contains only three carbons. And, and the shorter side chain of THCV um, likely suggests why THCV has lower binding affinity. Uh, at CB1. Longer side chains increase cannabinoid receptor binding uh, affinity, uh, but there is some diminishing return after about eight carbons. 
So the future of CD1 antagonists as an antidote to THC toxicity is likely, at least initially, via synthetic compounds. In fact, there has been a lot of research and a number of synthetic cannabinoids uh, or compounds, I should say, that were developed specifically for CB1 antagonism. In the, in the early 90s and early 2000s, there were a lot of companies who were looking at CB1 inverse agonists and producing evidence demonstrating the, the efficacy of CB1 inverse agonists for the treatment of metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia. And this evidence was uh, sufficiently convincing. In 1994, Sanofi Pharmaceutical developed Romanovant. It was the first commercially available CB1 receptor inverse agonist. It was marketed as uh, Complia. And, and Romanovant can produce effects at CB1 that are the opposite of those produced by CB1 agonists like THC. It suppresses appetite. Uh, in a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, Romanovant produced a significant reduction in body weights of subjects. Uh, they were seeing up to 15 pounds of uh, weight loss over a two-year period um, relative to a placebo, a placebo among the groups taking about 20 milligrams of Romanovant daily. Uh, it was approved by the European Commission in 2006 for the treatment of obesity. It was available uh, for use in the UK, and by, by 2008, it was available in, 20, or in 56 countries. Uh, unfortunately, Romanovant also produced significant anxiety, depression, suicidality. Uh, so in October of 2008, the European Commission determined that its risks outweighed its benefits, and it withdrew the drug from the market in January of 2009. Now, the withdrawal of Romanovant from the market led to a rapid abandonment of pharmaceutical research looking at the development of CD1 inverse agonists all of which were suspended due to the potential uh, for severe psychiatric side effects. So there were things like Saranavon. This was also being developed by Sanofi uh, to help with tobacco smoking cessation. Discontinued at the end of 2008, there was Drinavant. This was a third CB1 receptor antagonist being developed by Sanofi. This was for the treatment of obesity, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and also nicotine uh, dependence. Uh, they, uh, they discontinued Drinabot during phase two trials uh, in 2009. There was a drug called Teranabot, which was being developed by Merck uh, as a treatment for obesity. This was discontinued during phase three human clinical trials in 2009. Merck already had data from phase three clinical trials that showed greater efficacy and uh, more adverse effects with, that were associated with higher doses of Teranabot. There was Rosanabot. Uh, which was being developed by a Spanish pharmaceutical company called Esteve, um, for, also for the treatment of obesity, discontinued in 2009. Otenabot, uh, developed by Pfizer as a treatment for obesity, terminated during phase three uh, development programs. Again, these were really effective at treating obesity and facilitating weight loss, and pharmaceutical companies committed millions of dollars to this research, and there were many, many others as well. So what's changed? Um, why are pharmaceutical companies wading back into the murky waters of CB1 antagonism? Uh, well, first, there's a renewed interest in developing CB1 neutral antagonists rather than CB1 inverse agonists. Now, a neutral antagonist will, will, um, will not block the constitutive activity of CB1. Rather, it just simply competitively blocks other agonists, so things like you know, endocannabinoids and other lipid mediator agonists that bind to CB1. So it really just prevents the activation of the CB1 receptor, but it doesn't inhibit that constitutive activity that a, a CB1 inverse agonist does. Also, historically, it was sometimes really difficult to distinguish between a neutral antagonist and an inverse agonist. So, you know, to determine whether an antagonist is really an inverse agonist, it requires a certain amount of ligand efficacy at a receptor. It also requires a detectable degree of constitutive activity in the receptor system. You know, in, in traditional receptor theory, inverse agonists didn't even exist. We didn't know about them. They're somewhat of a, a recent discovery. Uh, and recent advancements have enabled researchers to determine if a ligand inhibits or stimulates the G proteins that are on the other end of that receptor protein. And antagonists don't have any effect on the G protein. So they can look at 
you know, when, when a ligand binds, if it's an antagonist, they can look at the G protein on the other end and see if it does anything. Uh, and if it's an inverse agonist, it's going to inhibit the activity of that family of proteins. So they now have that technology that enables them to really distinguish between the two. So with these advancements and renewed interest, uh, we are starting to see synthetic CB1 antagonists back in development. Uh, even one of the Avants that I mentioned earlier seems to have survived. In 2018, Drinabont uh, was licensed by Opiate Pharmaceuticals, and they intend to develop it for the treatment of acute cannabinoid overdose uh, as an injectable for administration in an emergency department setting. Uh, a second CB1 antagonist has, uh, has recently completed phase two clinical trials. So this is a compound called ANEB001, uh, it's developed by Nebulo uh, Pharmaceuticals. Uh, this is a small molecule cannabinoid receptor antagonist. It was developed to address acute cannabis intoxication. Again, it's intended to be used in a clinical setting. And the company states that uh, this, um, this drug is orally bioavailable. It's readily absorbed and it will rapidly reverse uh, key symptoms of acute cannabis intoxication. And then finally, there have been some initiatives to create CB1 antagonists that bind only to peripheral CB1 receptors. So these are compounds that are created with very little ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. The idea is that these compounds can have the same efficacy uh, as the previous generation of CB1 inverse agonists and antagonists, um, but uh, inverse agonists, but with better safety profile and with fewer adverse effects. So this is a company called 7TM Pharma. Uh, they reported uh, the development of one of these compounds. It's called TM38837. And this compound is likely the first of um, many CB1 antag antagonists that will be, will be developed to help treat uh, metabolic disorders. So the company has actually completed some initial studies in rats and mice, um, which suggested evidence that the drug was equally as effective as Ramanabant uh, and has a significantly lower propensity than Ramanabant to cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, they've also completed a phase one uh, human trial. Typically, phase one trials are simply to establish safety in humans. So uh, the researchers reported that in 48 healthy, normal weight humans, uh, the drug was well tolerated even at the highest dose. And they did have seven um, uh, volunteers who experienced brief mild drug-related side effects. You know, I think uh, abdominal discomfort was really the main, the main adverse effect. So given the effectiveness of CB1 suppression on metabolic disorders, I'm, I'm confident that we will be hearing more about synthetic options. Also, as we continue to explore and understand the cannabis plan, I think it's very likely that researchers might find additional CB1 antagonists in the plant as well. And I'm confident that we're probably gonna see more research um, uh, using THCV uh, to suppress appetite as well. Uh, so that includes our 20 minute lecture. So thanks for indulging us tonight. Uh, we still have about seven minutes uh, for questions. So please unmute yourself or throw them in the chat.